All right. I had to make a choice tonight. Either we go back to Deuteronomy 6, well, actually Exodus 17, then to get to Deuteronomy 6, to get back to Matthew chapter 4, which I want to do and want, and wanted to kind of go there. I kind of need to go there, but because of Sunday school, we decided, or I decided, I should say, there's no we. I decided that uh, because of the way Sunday school kind of went, we went to the Song of Solomon, and we started an overview of the Song of Solomon. So we're going to go back to that. The only reason is we never know what's going to happen on a Wednesday. So if Wednesday doesn't happen, that would put the Song of Solomon to next Sunday. And then, depending how Sunday school goes or, yeah, I, I, because with the Song of Solomon and all of the issues we're dealing with, you got to kind of pick and choose when to cover some of those subjects because we're dealing with some, you know, pretty you know, some things that a lot of people may not want to hear. So I figured tonight's the time to do it and see if we can finish the overview. I don't know if we can because we have a lot of issues to deal with. So let's go back. So just a quick reminder how it all started. I did a today's focus on Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, which says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. I use that verse because on that particular day that I did the Today's Focus broadcast, Spurgeon, his devotional, was tied to that verse. Spurgeon, on that day, used the verse in a very allegorical way because he, the way he approached it was, my beloved is Christ, or God, spake and said unto me, and the me there is the individual Christian, rise up, meaning Rise up from your spiritual apathy, rise up from your worldliness, and follow him, right? So he turned it all into a spiritual allegory. As soon as I read that, I was like, what is this nonsense? And so I turned on the um, microphone and basically for the today's focus told everyone, hey, is this the correct way to handle this passage? So what I told everyone to do is to go to the Song of Solomon, start in chapter 1, verse 1, go through the entire book verse by verse, and see if the allegorical approach will work. I think any reasonable person would find themselves with some great <laughs> discomfort taking a allegorical approach. One, not only is it going to be uncomfortable because you're going to be trying to explain things that are going to be hard to explain, right? Uh, you're going to be like, uh, that's odd if that's God and that's me. How do I understand what is happening here? It's going to feel very not right. Secondly, I think any average person just sitting in the pew and you hand them the Song of Solomon and go, hey, this is an allegory. You go over to the Sunday school classroom, come back and interpret the allegory. Can you imagine what you would get if you did that? I mean, it would be insanity. It would be just crazy. So I thought, hey, I gave everyone a little bit of, a, a little bit of homework. I'm done with, the, you know, I'm done. I can go on with my day, Right. Well, I don't remember if it was the next day. It was a couple of hours later. I got this long email, and let's just say someone wasn't happy with that approach. They were very, very, very mad that I would call into question the allegorical approach. So they sent me a long email, you know, attacking me that I'm silly, I'm disingenuous, I'm blind, I have a dead faith. Basically, I'm lost because I don't, you know, agree with their interpretation. So I uh, spent two plus hours responding to every attack, every criticism, and everything. Of course, what the person did not do was the homework that I asked, because anyone who ever disagrees never does the homework, because for some weird reason, I don't know why. Because if they do the homework, I think most of the time, as I said earlier this morning, is even though you still disagree, your disagreement should be how far? You think it would be... Like this, right? Because the more you study, the more you eliminate other possibilities, right? You, you're like, the more you actually do the study, you're like, well, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. Okay, we're only left with these couple of things. So I, I went through all of that, did my very best, and then I did a podcast where I went through the four, at least suggested, at least according to one source, there's probably far, far more of these, four different ways of interpreting the Song of Solomon, All right. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm just going to review these quickly, but I'm not going to be able to explain each one. You'll have to go back and listen to the message this morning. All right. There are four. What was the four ways? I gave five, but what were the four ways the book gave to understand or interpret the Song of Solomon? Number one, it's an allegory of God's love for Israel. 
Now, if we're going to go with the allegorical method, this one makes the most sense. Why? It's written by who was a king of? And it's located where? In the Old Testament. So that one, that one would make the most sense, right? That this is an allegory of God and Israel. God is, 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 the, uh, is the, you know, the man is Solomon in the book and, and the woman is Israel. Okay, again, if you take that to its logical conclusion, it gets really uncomfortable, everyone. It just gets really uncomfortable because those who approach this, you know, well, yeah, it just gets, it just gets odd. All right, the second one, It's an allegory of Christ and his love for the church. So how do you look at that? Well, Solomon is, is Christ and the woman is the church. Okay, that, that sounds so good, but it just gets weird. I mean, like if you go through church history, you got, you got parts of Song of Solomon that talks about her two breasts. And so what do they do? They say the two breasts is symbolic of the Old and New Testament and Christ lays between her two breasts. That just is, that gets just weird, okay? I'm sorry, that gets weird, all right? And I won't even go into the other things that happen because that's the, that's a mild ver- verse we can look at, okay? The, the book gets, I mean, the, how can we say it? it gets graphic? Now Some will say, no, it's not that graphic. It gets graphic, okay? <laughs> okay, it gets graphic, okay? There's just no way to get around it, okay? So when you start, out, and that's why the early church went with the allegory. And you can see why, because if you don't go with the allegory, you're like, uh, yeah, let's give this to the kids in Sunday school to read, right? No, no, okay, kids, it, not, none of it appears what it seems to be. It's all an allegory. But guess who gets to explain the allegory? There's no rules, there's no rules to it, right? Now, two breasts are the Old and New Testament. Like, how, where did that come from? Right? Do you just start making stuff up, right? Okay, so uh, the third one is, yeah, well, remember, we, we changed that. It's the original type of Christ and the church and marriage, right? It's the marriage illustration between Christ and the church. And then the extended version is in Ephesians, right? In Ephesians, okay? They say it's the extended version, but that would make no sense since it would be the original. So the third view is that this is, an, this is the original illustration of Christ and the church in marriage. Once again, it gets bizarre if you go with that. It gets just, oh, all right? The fourth one is... Yeah, this is, the fourth view is that this basically exalts human love and emotion as this wonderful thing to have, all right? Now, this one is the more literal approach, but the only problem with this one is it's literal, but it's not really literal. <laughs> it's literal, but what they come along with, and they do this, they want to clean it up to make it look beautiful and wonderful and nice, but there's nothing beautiful and wonderful, and nice about it, all right? Because while Solomon is describing in a literal way his physical intimacy with this woman, we have to remember a couple of things. First, it is Solomon who has 700 wives, 300 concubines, so this would literally be the description of physical intimacy that we would call adultery, all right? There's no way to clean this up. Even in the book, he talks about how many women he has. He just says she is one of many. He may be my favorite. She may be my favorite, but he only had how many at the time when he wrote the book? It was like... And numerous virgins. Yeah, too many to number, right? So even then, so we, we believe the Song of Solomon was written when? Remember we talked about this? Early in his reign as king. Yeah, so he, he didn't have all the women yet, but he already had plenty. And even in the book, he, he talks about how many he has. Well, that's messed up, ladies and gentlemen. Right? We can, you Christians can come along and try to, you know, make it look all sweet. There's nothing sweet about it. This is a man describing an intimate relationship with one of many women. Now, you can try to allegorize it, but if you allegorize it, then it gets really weird, right? 
Now you've got, I don't know what's going on, because you've got some graphic passages that you have to try to make them, oh, that's Jesus. Whoa, that's, that's just got weird, okay? So those, are the, so those are the total of five possible views, all right? View number one, God in Israel. View number two, Christ in the church. View number three, the original marriage illustration, right? Number four, that it's love and emotion in a beautiful, powerful, good way. And number five, this is just a, a disturbing story of physical intimacy and love. There's just no way to get around. I, I, I just no way to get around it. Okay, so what we started doing, we started trying to work on this, right? Now, this is the one thing we do know. We do know that when you read the Song of Solomon, it is very unique from everything else that we read. There's nothing like it. Now, typically, when a book or a passage is really unique and weird, what does that typically tell us hermen- uh, hermeneutically? It typically tells us to go to an allegorical approach. We're like, wait, this is just stands up. The only problem is, if we do the allegorical approach, it falls apart because now you got Jesus and, or God and the woman, and I don't know what's going on, Right? That gets weird, right? So that doesn't work. So what we started trying to figure out is that maybe the way to understand the Song of Solomon is make it literal, but put it in the context of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. We know all three books were written during the reign of Solomon within a 40-year span for the best we can tell. Now, some say the Proverbs weren't ultimately compiled to much later, but that they were written during the time of Solomon. Okay, so this is the way we, we, we think we work this out, at least to some level. The first book would have been Song of Solomon, right? Would have been early on, some say within the first two, three years of his reign, all right? Possibly. We don't know, right? But somewhere, early. The second one would have possibly been Proverbs, So it seems like, think of his stages in life. Early on, he was pursuing women. Then he started pursuing wisdom, right? Because he seems to have kind of grown tired, frustrated, and irritated with the women, right? So then he's like, I'm going to pursue knowledge and wisdom. And then by the time you get to the end of his life, Ecclesiastes, he talks about his frustrations with both of those. He talks about how all the wisdom in the world, but that the same thing is going to happen to the fool, is going to happen to the wise person, right? He kind of, he's, I mean, there's a lot of praise of wisdom in Ecclesiastes, but there's also kind of a willingness to acknowledge that it's vanity to some level. Then I think it's Ecclesiastes 7 where he starts having some negative things to say about women that we talked about. Yeah, 7, 7 what? Yeah, 26 through 29, he starts seemingly to get a little frustrated. Hey, women are just kind of meaningless in vanity, right? So it almost is, if we look at it in that context, we don't need to come and clean it up. That it's just a what? A historical picture of a phase in the life of Solomon. Because, do we, we do, look, do we go and clean up how the wonderful relationship between Abram and Hagar? No, we, we can't. Well, some churches try to clean that up. There's nothing beautiful about that. That's some messed up stuff going on. Like there's plenty of things in the Bible that are not pretty, agreed? So maybe this is not supposed to be so pretty. Maybe you're like, what was Solomon doing? Right? Oh, now, now oh, look, he's got it all figured out. He's pursuing wisdom. But we all know the wisest man, just think about this, the wisest man in the Bible ends his life as a polygamist, an adulterer, and an idolater. That's how Solomon's life ends. Now, some will say, well, he wrote Ecclesiastes at the very, very, very end to realize that he was wrong. Maybe so, but there's no way to get around it. That's that's his legacy at the end. Oh, and a divided kingdom. And a divided kingdom, because he definitely did not help in that situation, did he? No. So that's, a, that's kind of a sad story, right? The wisest man, meaning that all the wisdom in the world 
Stacy said it this morning. All the wisdom in the world doesn't what? How did you say it? Wisdom does not change depravity. Wisdom does not modify depravity. Wisdom does not remove depravity. Depravity remains. You would hope wisdom would be able to fix it, but it doesn't. So when we look at it that way, we're kind of like, we think that's the only way to possibly deal with this book. That's, that's the hypothesis we put forward. Now, who knows how many emails I'm going to get people disagreeing with that, but nothing else works. So what we're doing now is doing an, overbook, an overview. So if you have the Bible dictionary, turn to the entry on the Song of Solomon. And we're going to try to do a, a good, hard, almost 45 minutes on this and see how far we can get. All right, page one, 1,192. If anybody needs a dictionary, there's others laying around if you need one. If anybody need one, you need one? <coughs> uh, they're, they're all over the place. I just got to find out where one is. There's one right here. One thousand one hundred and ninety-two. Right, that's the correct page. Okay, it's a number. So if I state a number, you can almost be sure it's wrong. Okay, right. here we go. All right, everybody ready? One thousand one hundred ninety-two. I'll give you a chance to find it. All right, Song of Solomon. Here we go. An Old Testament book written in the form of a Lyrical love song, all right? Now, it's a lyrical love song. We talked about this. It's a song, meaning it's going to be connected with what kind of literature? Po poetic, poetry, meaning there's going to be a little bit of maybe exaggerated language. But just remember, even in the Psalms and even in sections of Job, they express emotions and feelings and things that we would not say is to be prescriptive, but it is only... Descriptive. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. We don't have to necessarily come in and purify all of this, right? Some interpreters believe the song speaks symbolically of the love of God for the nation of Israel. Well, you go with that, it gets really, really weird. That's all I can say. But others insist it should be interpreted literally as a healthy expression of romantic love between a man and a woman. Again, you have to purify the book. There's nothing healthy in the book. He says, hey, I've got other women, okay? That's not healthy, right? I mean, if, if Emma comes home and says, hey, mom and dad, I just want you to know, Nick has a hundred other wives and we're going to go live in a, polyg a polygamous commune in Utah, right? Uh, would y'all say that's a healthy relationship? Okay. <laughs> I'm, theoretically, okay, theoretically, okay. You, know, you would be like, I don't know. And we say, hey, S Song of Solomon is an expression of a healthy relationship. Like, I don't know why anybody would write that. There's nothing healthy about, even, even the one book that I was reading from this morning, uh, they, even they were like, Solomon is not an, a, a role model for sexual fidelity or marriage, right? He's not. Okay, so, but uh, that just drives me crazy, All right? Here we go. It is certainly one of the most unusual in the Bible. Now remember, that's important hermeneutically. What do we do whenever we come to a passage that's very unusual and doesn't seem to make sense literally? Well, we, we almost always look for an allegorical. But then if the allegorical is more confused than the literal, then we have to stick with the literal, right? Okay, does that make sense? Like, yeah, because, and not only that, anyone, and anyone who wants to argue with me that it's allegorical, almost anyone who ever argues with me it's allegorical, guess where they get their allegory from? Some commentary or some book. Because give me a church of 100 people, hand them the Bible and say, go work all of chapter one or all of chapter two. Right? And then you come up with what it allegorizes. What do you think it would look like? Do you think it would be total, utter, interpretive chaos? There's, there, there's just no rules to guard. I mean, it would just be insane. It would just be total, utter chaos. Like, if, for example, 
Like in church history, the two breasts represent the Old and New Testament. Who would come up with that? I mean, like, well, look, I mean, how many people in a church, if you hand them the, 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 that we come back and go, oh, that's old and new. Do you think there would be two people who would agree on that? No. So guess where they would have gotten that from? So you would have to, you would have to, if someone came up with it, it's because they read it somewhere else. I'm like, if, I would love to get 100 people who don't, have never read a commentary or heard a sermon on the Song of Solomon and say, hey, guys, it's an allegory. Go allegorize it. Right? That would be insane. That would, I guarantee you it would be insane. And if you don't believe me, just go look up all the sermons that allegorize it and come back and see how utter... Or, guess what? If you, if you think they're allegorizing it, just do a little research, and even if the pastor doesn't tell you, he's getting the allegory from a commentary. He's getting it from a book. I remember when we went through it, uh, when we tried this a long time ago, I can't remember which book I brought. I think it was Watchmen Me. I brought his allegorical approach, and I'm like, we're going to use this. And we, did we even make it through chapter one? Yeah, I think we made it almost through halfway through so, uh, of chapter one, and I think pretty much everybody in the church was like, that's it was like, that's the one weird time where everyone agreed that this has just got weird. Everyone agreed that it didn't work. So um, I, I, just, I just don't understand. I, the uniqueness, I, I do agree that it's unique. And I do agree that typically leads to allegory. But if you try to use allegory on this, I'm telling you, it's going to be the, it'll, it'll just be a disaster. All right. Uh, it says it's titled The Song of Songs implies it was the loveliest and best known of all the songs of Solomon, right? So they're saying that, and again, most people know it as Song of Songs, not Song of Solomon. Most people know it as Song of Songs. King James has Song of Solomon. I like to say Song of Solomon, and the reason I like to say Song of Solomon is because it forces us to deal with him. If we do Song of Songs, it kind of removes him from it, Okay, and I don't want to take him out of it because his shadow over, over I mean, he, he overshadows the entire book. Like, there's just no way. You can't remove Solomon from it because look at verse 1. Look at verse 1 of Song of Solomon. Yeah, I mean, it literally starts with telling you in Solomon's, right? I want to emphasize Solomon is involved because that greatly impacts how I'm going to approach the book. Does that make sense? All right? Okay, here we go. The structure of the book. What do you think we're going to find? The Song of Solomon is a brief book of only eight chapters. But in spite of its brevity, it has a complicated structure that sometimes confuses the reader. There's no way this book could confuse anyone. Now, I got to stop right here and just throw in a little hermeneutical theory, a little hermeneutical philosophy. Remember in the Protestant world, there's a doctrine that is constantly spoken of that Protestants claim is absolutely dogmatically true. Y'all remember what that is? There, within the Protestant world, there's a doctrine about scripture that is universal, accepted amongst all Protestants. That's like the foundational belief. Perpiscuity. There we go. So I remember the word. Very good. Okay. All right. Perpiscuity of Scripture, which says what? Scripture is clear and can be understood. Why is this a foundational belief for Protestantism? Because you don't need the magisterium. You don't need the priest. You can understand the Bible. I love everyone says that. And then every time we... Remember when we were looking at commentaries on Romans, what we kept finding? One of the most complicated chapters in the Bible. Very difficult to understand. One of the most complicated passages. One of the most complicated. Over and over and over, commentaries say that about everything. About every chapter. Well, why can you keep saying how complicated it is, how confusing it is, if Scripture is supposedly clear? And if it was so clear, why do we have thousands and thousands and thousands of denominations? Clearly, it's not clear, right? So you know how I reject that view outright. I don't care if it makes Protestants mad. So be it. Don't argue to me the clarity of Scripture. 
Prove to me the clarity of Scripture. And if you're going to prove to me the clarity of Scripture, there should be what? How many commentaries? Uh, well, let's just say 10, maybe 20. Let's say 30, maybe even 100, okay? We've got bazillions of them, and nobody can agree on anything, okay? We can't even agree on the word baptism, for crying out loud. So, but once again, what do we find? That just the structure of the book is complicated, and it does what? Confuses the reader. If the structure of the book confuses the reader, what are we going to do when we start reading the words? <laughs> okay. The word starts confusing people. All right, what's the next sentence? Several different characters or personalities have speaking parts within the long lyrical poem. Stop right here. Now, what does that tell you? What, what interpretive method would this be difficult to, to fit in with? Allegorical. Why would it be difficult to fit into the allegorical? Well, if you've got different personalities, or how does it use the word characters? If you have different characters, what is that going to force you to do? You've got to figure out who each character represents. Okay, well, well, first, who gets to determine who the character represents? Right? For example, this morning, we were in Exodus 17, right? And we talked about the rock. That Moses struck the rock, water came out. It seemed weird. Because why would they be given water considering they were in trouble for tempting God? And we're like, well, that's a sign of mercy and a kind of grace. I'm like, but because it's kind of a unique pas passage, because you're striking a rock and water is coming out, I'm like, well, maybe there's a picture, there's a type here, right? So what did we do? We went to 1 Corinthians, and we found out that the rock was, oh, wait a minute. It literally says it was a picture. Well, guess what? When the text tells you something and identifies the object with Christ, then you can say that pictures Christ. In the New Testament, Christ is identified as our rock and as our Passover. So then I can go to the Passover and say that points to Christ. Now, I tried to articulate this principle, and I was told that that is stupid, that basically too academic, and that's just a dumb rule. Why? Well, then what? Who, who gets to make the rules then? Because, if, because then if you can just go through and then you, who gets to say then what each character represents? I would argue I know what the character represents if somewhere in the Bible the character is identified. That to me seems like a solid hermeneutical principle. So if we identify who all the characters are who speak in the book, then what would, be a, what would be a good hermeneutical step to take? Then go look anywhere in the Bible to see if that character is referenced elsewhere and if it's identified as being someone else, right? If we don't find that, then what conclusion would we have to come to? It's probably best to stick with it as being literal. Does that make sense? All right, let's just see if that works. Okay, so... Um, so s several different characters or personalities have speaking parts within this long lyrical poem. Just keep that in mind. Let's see if, we can, if they name the characters, right? Okay. In most translations of the Bible, these speakers change abruptly with no identification to help the reader follow the narrative. Oh, you got to love that. So now, not only are there different characters, what else happens? They're not even identified, and sometimes we don't even know when it changes. I think uh, that's one of your complaints with Isaiah, right? Stacy complains about Isaiah because he's like, wait, who's, who, wait, what, who, what's going on, right? Well, whenever that happens, you got to do what immediately from an interpretive standpoint? you got to be like, caution, caution, especially if you're going allegorical because you got to know who's talking to fit the allegory, <laughs> right? Agreed? Okay, everyone, everyone should say amen there. Okay, all right, here we go. But the, in the New King James Version, clears up the confusion by publishing identification lines within the text. Oh, that's interesting. Well, well that's, that's interesting. So that would mean it would be, if we're ever going to study this book, what should we do? 
get a new King James. At least have one stand by. Now, what should be the obvious question anyone should ask, though? Obviously, if they identify it, that's the translators doing so. So that is what? Is that an a, a observation or is that a, a, an interpretation? That's an interpretation. Now, it could be very, very helpful to say, hey, this is how they are doing the identification, but clearly it's not in the original text. So you would look at it as a commentary. It would be fascinating to see. I don't think I've ever seen it in the New King James, but now I want to go buy a New King James just to see what that looks like. All right? Does that make sense? All right. So let's go through this. All right? This helps the reader gain a clear understanding of this beautiful song. Now, once again, they say it's beautiful. And it gives a clear understanding. So do I? Okay. Okay. Oh, it's clearer understanding. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you. A clearer understanding. But just remember, it's giving you a clear understanding, not because of the original, but because some translators came along and tried to clear it up. Meaning, it wasn't that the original was clear. It means it needed someone to help clear it up, which, once again, goes against the whole argument the Protestants make in the first place. But I won't, I won't dwell on that, because I just tick everyone off who, who is reformed, but that's okay. All right? So far, so good? So at this point, what can we say? It's an unusual book that based off its structure and numerous characters is very hard to understand. However, the New King James may be the only thing to help us figure it out. But even that is not... The New King James, oh, what's the only thing it's providing? Some identification on who is speaking. It still doesn't get us on how we interpret it. Right? Okay. Next... Well, it, just, it may just be identified when they're speaking and then identify the change. Good point, good point. It may just, the New King James just may say, this person is speaking and now there's a change. I don't know if it's going to identify exactly who they are, but we, that, that would be something to look at, all right? The three main parties with speaking parts are, oh, well, we're, going to get, we're going to identify three of them. All right, here are they. You ready? Number one, the groom which literally would be King Solomon. Now, just remember, if we go allegorical, who could it be? God the Father could be Jesus. Now, I, you say, well, it's not a big deal. It's somewhat of a big deal because you've got to identify which part of the Trinity is speaking here and what's going on. The real question would be the next part. Okay, the bride, a woman referred to as the... Shulamite. Everybody see that? Now, wait a minute. Now, who's the woman? Clearly, there is massive disagreement on this, right? What are the three ways of approaching the woman? Israel, the church as a collective body, or the individual Christian? Well, those are radically different in how you're going to approach that, right? Right? Well, who gets to determine who the woman is? What would we need to determine who the woman is? What would we need to be able to determine who the woman is? Yeah, we would have to find a reference somewhere that identifies the woman, a quote from the Song of Solomon. And when I, when I tried to explain that, that email was like, that is stupid and that is ridiculous and that is so academic. And it's like... What do you want then? So you get to tell me who the Shul- Shulamite, Sh- if I can say, the Shulamite woman is? Like, if you get to tell me, why don't I get to tell you? Right? Does that make sense? All right. Who's the third? The daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters? Okay, it's a group. These women of Jerusalem may have been royal servants who served as attendants to Solomon's Shulamite bride. In this love song, they serve as a chorus to echo the sentiments of the Shulamite, emphasizing her love and affection for Solomon. So if it's literal, that makes sense, right? See, in a literal sense, that's, that's, that doesn't, doesn't that make it so much easier? Oh, there, there are the attendants given to her because Solomon has all kinds of women you know, running around. Right? Hey, you're going, going to assist her. Okay? 
from a, from a literal standpoint, that fits perfectly. Now, if you go allegorical, who in the world are they? Oh, it, 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 who knows all the directions it could go, right? You want me to go grab some church fathers and show you how wacky it can get? Okay, we won't even go there because we know how the church fathers loved allegory, right? Can you imagine what they did with this book? I mean, yeah, whew, all right. I'll have to try to find some uh, church father commentaries on it. I think I have a, um, I, I think I have the ancient faith study Bible somewhere back there that probably will show you how crazy it can get, but we won't, we won't do that for now, right? But yeah, but it would probably get crazy, okay? So, in addition to these main personalities, the brothers of the Shulmanite bride are also mentioned in the poem, all right? So let's try to keep track of all of them. We have, we have the groom, which is King Solomon in a literal standpoint. Secondly, we have the bride, the Shulmanite woman, in a literal standpoint. Number three, we have the daughters of Jerusalem that would possibly be her attendants in a literal standpoint. And then next we have her brothers, which in a literal standpoint would be her brothers. <laughs> you see how much easier that is? Okay. All right. What else do we have? These may have been her stepbrothers. The poem indicates she worked under their commands as the keeper of the vineyard. Now, see, if you make the woman the church, do you see how weird it just got? So the, if, the, if the woman is the church, then who are the brothers that we work under? Oh, I bet you it's the Roman Catholic Church, right? No, okay, no, I don't know. Okay, I, I, who knows? I mean, do you see where that would get odd? Yes? Okay, All right. This beautiful love song falls naturally into two major sections of about equal length. The beginning of love, chapters 1 through 4, and the broadening of love, chapters 5 through 8. All right? Now, of course, that is an, that's an outline we would have to read the book a numerous times to determine if the outline is what? Observational or interpretive, right? Is it observational or is it interpretive? So what I would tell you, if you, if for those listening online who want to participate in this long, long work on Solomon that we're going to be doing, read the book at least five times, then come back and determine if that is an observational uh, a breakdown or an interpretive uh, uh, breakdown. If it's an interpretive, what do you do with it? You discard it because an outline is never to be interpretive. Never to be interpretive. An outline is what kind of a tool? An observational tool because you're just trying to take the book and breaking it down into a way where you can observe the parts. You're not trying to interpret anything. Everybody wants to go immediately to interpretation and that's always a flaw. All right, next. And the first section Shulmanite d- tells about Solomon's visit to her home and the country in the springtime. Now, again, if you start trying to do this allegorical, well, yeah, yeah I won't even go into all the things that happen, all right? She also recalls the many happy experiences of their courtship when she visited Solomon in the palace in Jerusalem, chapter 2, 4 through 7. Now, please note, if you take all of that literal, is that hard to figure out? If you take it, that, that makes perfect sense, right? There's courtship. There's a visit to the palace, right? Now, again, we don't, we don't have to make a moral judgment about it. It's just making, this is what happened. Now, it's probably describing that using what kind of language? Poetical language, right? So we know that there's going to be a little bit of exaggeration, the emotion or exaggeration, exagger, exaggerating what is going on, but we can still take it in a very literal way, correct? And, and you're, nobody's going to be confused by that. Right? Next, uh, she thinks about the painful separations from his love during this time, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, as well as the joyous wedding procession to Jerusalem to become the king's bride. Of course, you know, just one of many, but okay, you know, I digress, right? Um, Solomon also praises his bride to be, uh, to be in a beautiful poem on the magic and wonder of love in chapter 4. 
Now, if we take all of that literal, is there any problems with it? You should be able to read that and go, okay. You could probably see all of that. Now, the minute we make it allegorical, what happens? It just becomes a mess. Becomes a mess. All right, next, in the second section of the book, the love of the Shulamite, Shulamite, and Solomon for each other continues to deepen after their marriage. She has a troubled dream where he seems distant and unconcerned, chapter 5, 2 through 8. But Solomon assures her of his love and praises her beauty. Chapter 6, I wonder why he could be distant. Maybe because he's with all the other women, but I digress, all right? Chapter 6, verses 4 through chapter 7, verse 9. Longing to visit her country's home, 710 through 84, she finally makes the trip with Solomon and their love grows even stronger, 85 through 7. The song closes with an assurance of each uh, to the other that they will always remain close in their love. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Now, again, if you take that all literal, pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Spurgeon. Oh, yeah. Now, now I want to, okay, very good point. And I, and I hopefully, have, if I haven't made this clear, I completely agree. If I go through Song of Solomon and grab certain verses, right, and let's say I just choose maybe 15 verses, 20 verses, I could create a beautiful allegory about Christ the church or Christ and the believer. The problem is that doesn't work when you go verse by verse. You have to take sections. And that's why when we did it in the church, it started off and everybody thought, oh, this is working really good, right? And then we made it, I don't remember how many verses, and then everybody got, oh, that just got weird. And then everybody's like, okay, that's not going to work. But yeah, if you just take one little verse, you're like, yeah, yeah, whoa, that's a beautiful picture. How did you find that, pastor? Well, I was reading a book, right? Okay. So what I did is brought, the, like I said, like showing up in the pulpit claiming I had it all figured out, I brought the book with me. And then we immediately like get rid of that book because it's crazy. <laughs> it, it, it's nuts. All right. Now, authorship and date. All right, here we go. So I want you to see, main thing I want you to see, that description taken literally is not complicated or hard to figure out. What would probably be the most difficult part reading it that way? Just some of the poetic language would probably throw you off. Maybe the structure. Maybe figure out who's speaking. But you'd be able to make out the basic story. But people, don't, people aren't content with that. It's got to be something spiritual, right? Okay, well, or it could just be about a relationship between a man and a woman, or man and one of his women, right? Authorship and date. Traditionally, authorship of the Song of Solomon has been assigned to Solomon since this book itself makes its claim. But some scholars reject this theory. Oh, imagine that. We can't even agree on this, all right? They insist it was a later collection of songs attributed to Solomon because of his reputation as a writer of Psalms and Proverbs, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. A careful analysis of the internal evidence, however, gives support to the view that Solomon wrote the book. Now, this is important. If Solomon wrote the book, that radically impacts how you have to handle it. Does that make, that's why I keep saying it's the Song of Solomon. Because if he wrote the book, I'm sorry, you got to deal with some serious issues. If we can get him away from the book, then you may say it's a beautiful story of a man and a woman. I still don't think you go allegorical, right? Because that's still not, it's gonna, still going to get weird. But at least it gets away from all the Solomon problem. But even they acknowledge that the internal evidence seems to support what? They said Solomon is mentioned by name several times. Let's look at them, everybody. Ready? Let's see if, we, if the dictionary is correct here. Chapter 1, verse 1. Is that, is that true? All right. Verse 5. Okay. Verse 5, it's there. Agreed? All right. Chapter 3, verse 7. Is Solomon mentioned? Okay. So he's mentioned there. Verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. King Solomon, chapter uh, 3, verse uh, 11. Chapter 8, verses 11 through 12. 
All right. Now, when, you, when one person is mentioned that many times, that's a pretty good indication that this is probably written by Solomon. Solomon is obviously the key character in this, right? Or at least a main, main character in it. Agreed? Okay. And he is specifically identified as the groom. The book also gives evidence of wealth, luxury, and exotic imported goods, chapter 3, 6 to 11. A, character, a characteristic of his administration. The groom of the song also assures the Sholemite bride that she is the only one, chapter 6, verse 9, among his 60 queens and 80 concubines, chapter 6, verse 8. Probably a reference by Solomon to his royal harem. At the height of his power and influence, Solomon was known to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, you know what cracks me up? Is the dictionary acknowledges Solomon had all of these women and then say, but this is a beautiful story of a healthy relationship. Like, how can you write that in the same entry? The minute you acknowledge Solomon has all of those women, the whole thing is concerning. No matter how much he supposedly assures her, she, you're the only one. But even in the book, she, she feels that he's distant from her. I wonder what can cause that. Right? Okay, 60 queens. I mean, he's got 60 queens for crying out loud. Hey, I want you to know, baby, you're my only queen. You're number 70 to 52. Like, hey, hey, like, I mean, come on. I mean, give me a break. Okay, I mean, ugh. Okay, the, this internal evidence supports the traditional view that Solomon himself wrote this song and bears his name. It must have been written early in his reign, probably about 965 B.C. There's another source saying it was early, right? So we know it was early. But even when it was early, he already has how many queens? 60. How many concubines? Well, how many? 80. I mean, come on. I mean... And an innumerable, yeah, they, they, they left the virgins out of this. They left that out of it, right? They left that out of it. But he has all kinds of virgins as well. All right? Like, I mean, come on. All right. The historical setting. All right? Here we go. All right. With his large harem, how could King Solomon write such a beautiful love song to one specific wife? All right. Well, first of all, we have one recorded. We don't know what he was sending the others. Right? Okay, just remember, whenever you read about anyone in the Bible, do we have every word they ever said? No. Do we have every communication they ever made? No. All right, so first of all, just because he wrote one for, we don't know, we, we do know this. What is it, First Kings? Hang on, I could be wrong, I could be wrong. Um, go to First Kings, is it chapter uh, 4, verse 32? Go to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. I think it's 1 Kings 4, 32. I could be wrong here. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. 1 Kings 4, 32? I, believe, I, 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 I may not say what I think it says. Tell me if I'm wrong. Or, well, I haven't told you what I, I think it says yet. He wrote 1,000 songs. 1,005 songs. So that doesn't, that doesn't mean this is the only song he wrote somebody, right? In fact, he wrote 1,005, and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I don't know where the other five went, okay? But, right? but that man meant that each one got a song. <laughs> okay, right, okay. But I'm just saying, like, you can't say, I just want to make sure when you say, well, how could he have just written this one for her? He wrote 1,005. Do I? I know. I mean, but, I mean, I'm not saying that's what he did. I'm just saying that we have to at least assume that it's a possibility, right? Now, the other ones may have been short. But we don't know. Maybe this one got eight chapters. Maybe the other one, the, hey, baby, you know, you, you know, just got a couple of a couple ones. Hey, don't show the other girls because I don't want them to get jealous because yours is really special. Okay, right? And, yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, look, we don't know exactly how it all played out. All right. Okay, we don't. So let's just make sure we at least deal with that, all right? Okay, here we go. How could he write a love song to one specific wife? Perhaps his union with the Sholemite woman was the only authentic marriage relationship Solomon ever knew. 
Oh, come on, man. Now you, you're just making a lot of assumptions here, right? Because first of all, we don't know he didn't write other songs to the other ones because the Bible tells us he wrote other songs, right? And then they go on to say, most of his marriages were political arrangements designed to seal treaties and trade assignments with other nations. Now, what's missing here? We would have to go find how many marriages of Solomon are recorded in Scripture. Like, do we, we'd have to go find every Scripture that tells us how he got the thousand women. I don't think there's a thousand descriptions of how he got each woman, right? So maybe some of them was for that reason. So I mean, like, but put it this way. If they had scriptural support, what do you think they would have offered here? A cross-reference, because they've been offering cross-references for other things, have they not? All right, okay, so I, I just, I mean, come on now. Uh, the Shul- Shulamite woman was not a cultured princess, but a lowly vineyard keeper whose skin had been darkened by her long exposure to the sun. Chapter 1, verse 6. Everybody look at chapter 1, verse 6. Just to note, then uh, right here, they're interpreting it in a literal way. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. They're taking that what? In a very literal way. Right, right? So some try to say that means because she was a sinner and Solomon was looking upon her with grace and love. I mean, come on. It's just ridiculous things that people do here. But okay, All right. But what I want you to know, they immediately quote a scripture here. The previous statement, they quote no scripture. Yet she was the bride to whom Solomon declared, how much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfume than all spices. Right? Well, you don't know if he didn't tell other women the same thing. We have no way of knowing. This has a real message about the nature of true love. Oh, man. Okay. I just got to have to ask a question here, right? Sarah, if you find out tomorrow that Stephen has a thousand women, okay, 999. I'm just going with 999, okay? Are you going to say that this is a picture of, how does it describe it? Uh, About the nature of true love. Authentic love is much more than a surface relationship. It extends to the very core of one's being. Love like this cannot be bought and sold like some commodity on the open market. Solomon had many wives, but the Sholemite may have been the only one with whom he enjoyed a warm, enriching relationship. Now, of course, what do they not provide? They have no way of knowing that. And not only that, what do we, we, what do we know biblically? Okay. He wrote a thousand, and it's it just weird that he wrote a thousand and five, and he had a thousand women. Is it just not a co- And we know at least one song was to the Sholemite. Isn't it just a possibility that there were other songs written to other women? I mean, it's possible. Put it this way. Can I say it's probable? I can't say it's probable, but I can say it's possible. And I can say that I don't know, I cannot, I cannot in any way, there's nothing that would, in the text that would say that this is possible or plausible what they're offering. They're just making mere conjecture. Right? The theological con- contribution. Now, here we go. Now, let's, let's stop right here. They're making a presupposition here that this book has to have a theological contribution. All I know, it's a book that does what? Is expressing, if we take it literal, his relationship with a woman written by a man who has plenty of other women, so it causes a lot of things troubling. And it it gets pretty graphic at times when you read it, okay? So let's see what they say the uh, theological contribution is. The great message of the Song of Solomon is the beauty of love between a man and a woman as experienced in the relationship of marriage. That is such trash. If we, if, we, if we want to say this in the most honest way, what could we say? This is a book that expresses the love between a man and a woman in a adulterous relationship. But we're not allowed to say that in church. 
But if she's one of a thousand, if she's a one of 999, It's adulterous, right? Okay, it's just adulterous at a level that we can't necessarily wrap our minds around, right? Like nobody wants to say that. Everybody wants to say it's it's this beautiful story. When I read it, it just gives me all these warm, nice feelings. I, I <laughs> it it causes some problems, does it not? All right, I think it does, all right? Um, in its frank but beautiful language, the song praises the mutual love that husband and wife feel toward each other in the highest of all human relationships. The sexual and physical side of marriage is a natural and proper part of God's plan, reflecting his purpose and desire for the human race. This is the same truth so evident at the beginning of time in the creation itself. God created men and a woman and brought them together to serve as companions and to share their lives with one another. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Like the book of Genesis, the Song of Solomon says out bold yes to the beauty and sanctity of married love. That Oh, my goodness gracious. I can't read that with a straight face. Come on. Let, let's be honest, right? Let's just have a, let's like, w- w- because we're a small church, we have no one to offend, right? Right? So we can be, we can just be blunt. If this book written by Sol, let's say Solomon was not in our Bible. Let's say Solomon was in the Quran. And he had all of these wives, right? Or in the Book of Mormon and had all of these wives. And then the Mormon stood up and go, this book shows the beauty and the sanctity of marriage. What would we do? We would mock it. We would condemn it. We would say how ungodly it is, how horrible it is, that it promotes polygamy, it promotes adultery, and they are wicked, vile Mormons. Put it in our Bible. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of the sanctity of marriage. <laughs> oh, come on now. We can't, we can't be... Th- Bible interpretation cannot descend into something so meaningless that we can take a book with the reality that this book has and just turn it into... Like, that's not being honest with the text. That's not even... That's not even... Come on, man. Like, that, I have a hard time even reading that with a straight face. But this book also points beyond human love to the great author of love. Authentic love is possible in the world because God brought love into being and planted that emotion in the hearts of his people. Even husbands and wives should remember that the love they share for one another is not a product of their human goodness or kindness. We're able to love because the love of God is working in our lives. So I I guess Solomon was able to love all of those women because God was working in his life. Like, what? Or, 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 yeah. Yeah, he loved one and hated the hundred nine hundred, which would not show such the sanctity of love, right? <laughs> okay, that would be like what a jerk, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? I don't know. I don't know. However, you twist it, it's going to have problems. All right. Um, he loved us in his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. None of that has to do with the Song of Solomon. None of that. None of that. I just no. Just no. All right, and then we got the last part, and we'll finish. I know it's already seven, but that's okay. Because we want to finish this. All right, here we go. The symbols and images that the groom uses to describe the beauty of a Sholomite bride may seem strange to modern readers. He portrays her hair as a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Her neck, he says, is like the Tower of David, built for an armory on which hangs a thousand bucklers. And the use of these symbols, the groom is reflecting the cultural patterns of the ancient world. To those who lived in Solomon's time, the rippling effect of a flock of goats moving down a hillside was indeed a thing of beauty. 
and a stately tower atop a wall uh, reflected an aura of stability and nobility. The Sholemite woman would have been very pleased at such creative compliments from her poetic groom. But once again, those are not some allegory to go, it's the church, it's Jesus. It's poetic language to compliment the woman, right? To make her go, oh, wow, he thinks that about me, right? Does that make sense? Uh, scholars are not certain of the exact meaning of the phrase, the Sholemite. We don't even know the meaning of the phrase. Isn't that wonderful, right? Which has come to be used as a title for the bride in this song. Since the word is a feminine form of the Hebrew word for Solomon, perhaps Sholemite simply means Solomon's bride. Because the poem makes several references to Lebanon, uh, some scholars believe she came from the mountainous territory along the Mediterranean coast and northwest Palestine. I wonder then if she was a, I wonder if she was a, a Jew. I wonder if she was an Israelite. I wonder if she happened to be. What do you think? A pagan. Because isn't that what Solomon gets in trouble with? Because all of his wives turned his heart from God. So is that a beautiful picture? And which woman would have had the greatest chance to turn his heart? The one that he wrote one beautiful poem to, because I guess he didn't write any of the other women, according to this. So which woman would have had, like, if she's the godly wife, remember this is a beautiful picture of basically Christian marriage, then she should have been the one turning him to whom? God. But clearly, the Sholmanite fails. Because when you get to 1 Kings, is it chapter 11? Everybody look really quick. Is it 1 Kings 11? I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing. So if I'm wrong, don't, don't mock me. Is it 1 Kings 11 that talks about the uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and they turn his heart away from God? Oh, oh wait. He loved many, so immediately we know that they, this is not the only woman he loved. So already the dictionary is lying to us. And his wives turned away his heart. So the Shulmanite woman is the one he loved supremely. Well, if she was a Christian woman, or, or, a, or I'm sorry, a Jewish woman who loved the true God of Israel, she should have been able to keep his heart right. But no, you know the problem was? He didn't just love her. He loved many of them. I wonder how many. Well, he wrote a thousand songs, so there's possibility he had a love for all of them in some way, shape, or form. And then what happens? He not only his heart's turned, what does it say he does? He builds altars. He does evil. So he built an altar, for, meaning all the wives were what? Pagan, which would possibly mean the Shulmanite was pagan. So how is that a beautiful love story? Let me throw out a hypothesis. You ready? And we'll end. Is it possible? Oh, wait. He claved to these, all of them in love. All right. Now, come on, let, let, me, let me try something. Are you ready for this? When we read the Song of Solomon, just everybody, everybody paying attention, I want everybody to hear this. It's this powerful love song written to, let's say, one of the women, Shul, Shulmanite woman, Solomon's bride. It's beautiful, it's power, it's passionate, Right? And everybody can look at going, whoa, what passion. But is it possible to demonstrate that one's passion, one's love can be so given over to a person that that person can become the very downfall of the wisest man who ever lived. That it shows that our passion, our love can be so given over to that which will actually take us from God, not drive us to God. Because clearly the Shulmanite woman doesn't lead him to God, leads him away from God. Maybe we should read the Song of Solomon 
as a cautionary tale. You can fall that madly in love, that passionate, and find yourself building an altar to a false god for the woman. That may change the way we read it. That would be a theological contribution to the book, right? That's passion. That's love. That's amazing. Wow, I wish I had that kind of love. A lot of people may read that like, man, I wish I had that kind of passionate love. But guess where it ends? Maybe it's a cautionary tale. Now, I know nobody preaches it that way. But I know this, when you read 1 Kings 11, all of a sudden everything starts coming into play. The dictionary completely lied to us. He loved all the women. 1 Kings uh, 3 demonstrates he wrote 1,005 songs. He claved to these women in love. And they turned their heart. Meaning, uh, if, if she's the supposedly godly one, she wasn't helpful. Right? And if his love for her was stronger, then she should have been, if she was the good one, she should have been leading him back to God, not away from God. So the whole thing falls, it blows up. Oh, oh yeah, what is it? what's the verse? Ecclesiastes 26, chapter 7. 26 through 29. What's his words? I find more bitter than death a woman whose heart is snared in net and her hands is banned. He says, he that God shall escape uh, her, God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. And then he says, behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Of all the women, he didn't find one. Because all those women became snares and traps that pulled him away from God. I th- so that seems to imply that the Shulmanite woman turned out to be a trap. Yeah, well, the, I think the rest of the story is Ecclesiastes and 1 Kings. Because we know that it's written at the beginning of his reign. At the, at the time, he's like, look at this woman. And by the end, he's like, what a trap. What a trap. What, how did I end up in this mess? And she didn't lead him to God. She led him away from God. Wow. I don't know. You, you, you take that for what you want. Let's pray. Lord God, we come for you this evening. A very powerful, powerful book if we see it as a cautionary tale. But Lord, no one in this room is claiming that we are 100% right. And Lord, just help us as we consider the Song of Solomon any, in any other way, that we would just continue to be humble, to have our thoughts and opinions changed, to try to figure out this very complicated book. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said,